ladies over across the way. I hope it's just ladies over there with our Ladies Day speaker hanging around for an extra day. We have been discussing the uh, the ways or the steps of how to bring one back to God. Somebody who has become unfaithful and somebody who uh, has drifted away, who has left the church, has left the Lord. How do we how do we work to help that person uh, to to come back or to regain, to rebuild, to reestablish that relationship that they once had, not only with the Lord, but also uh, with His family and the church. And so the first two steps in that dealt with forgiveness. And David, I know you all dealt a lot with forgiveness, so they kind of got a, a continuation of forgiveness uh, as we started this quarter on forgiving yourself and forgiving those who hurt you. And so that was step one and step two. Being able to admit your faults and admit your sins and repent of those and, and to receive the forgiveness that God offers and to move past those. Very challenging for many people to do. And then secondly, to acknowledge when somebody's hurt you and to be the bigger person and, and to offer them forgiveness maybe even when they don't want it or they don't see the need or acknowledge the fact that they have hurt you. And so that seems very unfair. Uh, it seems uh, uh, very unhuman to, to offer somebody forgiveness who don't even acknowledge that they've hurt you. Uh, but certainly, when, when we fail to forgive, then we put God in a position where He is unable to forgive us. And so therefore, that puts us into a a very jeopardizing situation as it relates to eternity and to our our ability to have a relationship with God because obviously there is a huge need for forgiveness. So we come to chapter 40 in the book. Step 3 then is overcoming disappointment. And and the author of the book he he throws around the words disappointment and discouragement. And, and ultimately what he says is that disappointment leads to discouragement. And so it's almost like he, he builds it as though, you know, at first you're just kind of disappointed. And then, and then you become discouraged. And so obviously the, the, the whole idea, whatever word you choose to use, is how do we overcome this? Do we know people who have been disappointed? Perhaps all of us in this room have been disappointed at some point in time. Be it failure, be it uh, someone let us down, be it a break in trust, be it uh, a job missed, a job opportunity missed. Um, so something didn't go our way, and, and it disappointed us. And, uh, someone didn't treat us the way they we thought they should have or someone didn't do something they said they would do and and so it it's it's called disappointment and we've all we've all experienced that what happens far too often as this author sees it in the church and you you've seen it too is that disappointment is never overcome and so what happens is is that ultimately that disappointment then leads to a discouragement and so disappointment's one thing. Discouragement is a, is a much deeper thing. When we begin to convince ourselves what we're doing doesn't matter, or that we don't matter, or that going to church doesn't matter, or that being around Christian people doesn't matter, or that you know doing what God would want us to do doesn't matter because it doesn't seem like we're getting anywhere with that, or... or uh, I was talking to one uh, middle schooler uh, over the weekend, and, and she said, you know, she said, I, I just think I'm trying to do what's right, and it just feels like I'm not getting anywhere. And, and that's not just for middle schoolers, right? It can be for adults as well. When we seem like we're being persecuted for doing what's right, and, and someone who's not doing what's right seems to be getting ahead or, or winning. And so that can lead to a 
huge battle of discouragement. So let's think about, as we began this morning then, just some, just some introductory questions. These are not in the book. These are just some that I wanted you and me to kind of battle around a little bit. Where does discouragement come from? Who would be the ultimate author of discouragement? You ever stopped and thought about that? I hate to ask a deep question right out of the right out of the gate this morning early. A lot of times it comes from people who are discouraged. Okay. All right. Um, Okay, all right. He discouraged, let some, allow someone to be discouraged, they allow themselves to be, and then, then that just dominoes the thing. Okay, so let's, let's go to the ultimate source and work our way backwards. Let's admit this morning that the ultimate source of discouragement is Satan. That he, he is the author of it all, okay? He, he desires to discourage everyone in any way possible as it relates to the church. As it relates to being faithful to God, his number one goal is to pull you away. So how is he going to do that? Well, his tactic most often is discouragement. Now, with, with the ultimate author clearly identified, now how does, he, how does he do that? Well, Jeremy's mentioned one way. He does that through other people. I, I, I feel like a broken record because it feels like the last two weeks all I've been saying is that hurting people hurt people. And I, I've said that I don't know how many times in the last two weeks. But, but hurting people hurt people. Well, Jeremy just said discouraged people discourage people. That, that's the way that works, right? People who are discouraged... In the same way, people who are hurting tend to be more likely to hurt others and, and maybe not even mean to, but, but they're hurting. And in the same way, people who are discouraged tend to be a, a great avenue for Satan to use to discourage you and I. So that's one avenue. What's another avenue that Satan might use to bring about discouragement? Okay, so he, he would use us, right? And he would, he would create a... Uh, I, think, I think we are a huge source of our own discouragement. It's because we're not pleased with... Uh, maybe it's a lack of contentment. Maybe a, I'm, I'm not asking you to get complacent here on me, okay? Don't, don't settle for less than your best. But, but far too often, we become dissatisfied or, or we're not content. And so because of that, we're not pleased with our own lives or where we are or what we haven't been able to do. Or, and so we discourage ourselves. And obviously Satan is, is using us as, as our own enemy. And so where does it come from? Well, obviously the ultimate source. Now how does that, how does that look? Any other thoughts about the avenues of discouragement? Those okay, so by and large, more people want to center on the negative than on the positive, and so more people want to be pessimistic than optimistic, right? And so, clearly, whether that be a, a group of co workers or whether that be a group of coffee drinkers or or whether that be, you know, your hunting buddies or, or whatever that is. If, if they are constantly focused on the negative, then that's going to be an avenue for discouragement to come in because, let's be honest, there are things that are not good, right? And there always have been, okay? It ain't new. I mean, it's not like we, we just all of a sudden created a, a world that has filled with negatives. There's always been things that weren't good. But there's always been things that are good too, right? It's a matter of perception. It's a matter of where your focus is. 
And so if, if, you, if you get on the dark side of the coin, then certainly you can be discouraged very easily. As it relates to the church, question number two, just as it relates to the church, how do people get discouraged? Be very specific with me here. Okay? Not following up with people who really need help. I had, a, I had an individual say to me just a few days ago now, they said, you know, for a couple of weeks we do really good in the church and then it's like almost like we forget. And, I, and uh, this was related to a death. And, and, and I had to admit, you know what? That is very, very true. Because we do. We, we really do. I think we do a good job. And I think we intend to do a good job all the time. But what happens is after a couple of weeks, and, and, so, and so we quit following up. Maybe we don't even follow up to start with. I hope that's not the case. But, but I would suggest to you that our follow-up runs out, possibly too early. In, in certain occasions and settings, okay? And I don't know the rhyme or reason or the perfect answer to that or, or the perfect solution. I'm just I'm admitting what Royce has said is that sometimes we don't follow up properly. Let's just say it like that. And, and people get discouraged when, when, the, when follow-up is needed and there's, and there's not an adequate amount of follow-up. Whatever that is. Yes, sir. That happens after baptism. Okay. There's another example. Not just in a... I used it in a... Well, it was in a death setting that I, that I had that conversation. But, but there's another setting with baptism. Ted mentions baptism. Somebody's baptized. And for, you know, whatever the period of time is, right? A, a two weeks, a month, or whatever. And then, and then, then we tend to back away or... or forget or get our minds somewhere else and and if we're not careful somebody can a, a, a newborn a babe in Christ a new Christian can get discouraged how else does this happen in the church okay okay somebody comes in to the church, and maybe their their scriptural, maybe their Bible knowledge is a little limited, and so and so they feel they feel inadequate to start with, because they 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 feel they they've concluded in their minds that everybody they're sitting around is just full of Bible. Well, that may or may not be an accurate statement. I wished and hoped that it would be, but they feel inadequate to start with. Okay, now. They don't find a place. They don't, they don't feel like they fit in. They're not encouraged to fit in. And, and, and let's not be just, I mean, let's not be just hard on ourselves, okay? Let's not beat ourselves completely down into the dust. So, sometimes people don't want to fit in. And, and we, we, we got to admit that. And ex some people just, refuse to, that they want to keep the distance, the barrier, the wall, whatever. But there are, and, and I don't know how we, I mean, we just got to keep loving and encouraging and, and, and trying to be there for them and, and, and show them we care and we love them and this ain't, you know, we have no ill intentions. We just want to help them be stronger Christians and hopefully that wall will come down. But for a lot of people, there's not a wall there. And they're looking to get plugged in, and they, they don't get plugged in. And so therefore, when they don't get plugged in, they become discouraged. Very good. Yes, sir.
Mm-hmm. Expectations. For those of you that can't hear David uh, or didn't hear him, expectations. We, we do have a high expectation of each other. And expectations are okay. There's nothing wrong with expectations. But, but like David said, we, we're all human in this room. And, and therefore, we are all sinners. And therefore, if you, if you stay around me or one of the elders long enough, regardless of your high expectations of us, we're going to let you down at some point. We're, we are men, just like many in this room. And so we're not perfect. Um, but with that said, I, I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want you to think, well, we just take away all of our expectations. I think David's caution is, is that we just we keep our expectations in a, in a proper balance because when, when, when expectations are not met, discour- disappointment, maybe is the initial reaction, and then discouragement is the ultimate uh, reaction to expectations not being met. So, keep expectations, yes, but keep, uh, keep them in a healthy, proper level of one another. Yes, sir. Okay. 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 Po- positive breeds encouragement, which would be the the opposite of discouragement, and what we're trying to encourage. And um, I, I think it's I think it's interesting. I've got a I've got a little book in my office about on uh, funeral outlines, funeral sermon, and there's a section in there, and this is when I use it the most. There's a section in that little book for non-Christians. And, and when I find myself in that setting, you're, it's a little more difficult for those of you who's never done a funeral um, to, to, to tackle that challenge. And so I find myself in my little book, my little, my little black funeral book, and, and in that section for non-Christians. And do you know that every, every sermon outline or every funeral outline in that section begins with this? Say something good about the person. Well, I mean, you can't say they're a Christian, right? You, you can't, there, there's a lot of things you cannot say, but find something good that you can say. You know, was this person a, a good employee? Was they a, a good gardener? Were they a good community person? You know, were they a good neighbor or, or a good husband or wife? Or Find something and so that, that, it's in every one of those outlines. First thing out of the gate is, you know, find something good to say because there is something good to say. You, you may have to look a little harder for some people than you do others, but the reality of it is there is, there is something good that you can say about everybody if you'll ask enough questions or if you'll look deep enough to try to be encouraging in some way. Question number three is, Pretty simple, isn't it? You ever been guilty of that? I'm sure I have. And all of us can be, right? We can be guilty of discouraging someone. And so, and so question number four then is, how do, we, how do we combat this feeling? How do we attack the feeling of, how do we keep people from being discouraged in the church? What do you think? Okay. Johnny says communication. Communication is one way that we can combat discouragement in the church. I fully agree. Maybe, maybe one of the hardest challenges in the church is communication it's a challenge in marriage it's a challenge in families it's a challenge at work okay the church is not in a bubble and dealing with a problem that 
that the rest of the world's not dealing with. It's in all realms of, of society. It's called communication. Communication is two ways, right? You get discouraged because, because I don't come visit you and I don't even know you're in the hospital. Some of you like to play hide-and-go-seek. I quit playing hide-and-go-seek when I was about eight, okay? I don't enjoy the game of hide-and-go-seek, all right? So, so my, my point is, I'm not mad at you. If you don't want me to know you're in the hospital, that's fine. Just don't be discouraged when I don't come see you, right? you you, you got to communicate or, or one of the elders don't come see you. Communication works both ways. You need the elders and I but specifically the elders, to communicate to you as a congregation. You need to know what's going on. You need to know what the elders are doing. They're not on a, they're not on a platform in a private closed meeting room somewhere. They have closed meetings, but, but you need to know what you can know from those meetings to know what's going on, what they expect of you, what they want from the congregation, what their plans and visions and desires are and how you can help that's their communication. Maybe they know about some, some particular family deals that, that you could help with, and so they communicate that to you to try to be an encouragement and, and vice versa. The communication, two-way communication. Uh, you have a need, make that need known. The elders have a need, they need to make that need known, right? It, it works both ways. What else? Okay, fellowship outside the assembly. I appreciate the specificness of that. Um, that is not to discount at all fellowship with inside the assembly. Uh, please don't misunderstand that. I know Doug is not discounting that at all. What he is emphasizing is the fact that, that you and I are stronger when we're together. And, and we're called to be together on the Lord's Day, and, and here we come, and we all gather, and we all fellowship, and, and, and we honor and glorify God. And, and we're going to keep doing that till, the, till time ends, right? Outside the assembly, what does that look like? How, how, how much encouragement could we gain for the week? You talk about being in the world all week, and, and, and dealing with the people of the world and, and how that can pull us down, well, how about we spend some time outside the assembly with each other and let's, let's build each other up, right? Let's fellowship together and, and, and strengthen each other. And, and how all that looks, well, you, you decide, right? Uh, there, there are many, 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 many avenues. We don't have time to give all the examples of ways to fellowship outside the assembly, but there are hundreds of thousands, right? That's going to build our relationships. And when we get discouraged, that's going to give us people that will help us to encourage us. What else? Okay. So, so in order to prevent discouragement and combat this feeling... You and I need to be the people we say we're going to be, right? So, so that we can count on each other and so that we're not, not following through and therefore creating uh, discouragement for someone. Yes, sir. Okay. So, to do the opposite of what we talked about earlier. Okay. Okay. To be the people that we claim to be. Well, Shank mentions, and I, I wanted us to have some lengthy discussion there, and I'm thankful that we did. But he, he admits in his book that once he became a Christian, he fell into the child syndrome. He fell into the spoiled child syndrome, as he called it. And so he would go to passages like Matthew 7, verses 7 and 8, and he would say, when I was a Christian... If I ask for it, God ought to give it to me. He fell into that. He fell into that belief that once I become a Christian, then I'll get everything I want, right? Because the Bible says if you ask, it'll be given. If you seek, you'll find. If you knock, the door will be open. That's what Jesus said, right? In Matthew 7. And so he said, what happened to me is I, I turned God into this genie in a bottle where, okay, God, now I'm a Christian. Now I'm a Christian, and I want this. So 
Wish number one. And God ought to just said, poof, there it is. I mean, I asked for it, God. I asked you for it. I wanted it, and you didn't give it. And so what he admits is that very early because of his spoiled child syndrome, as he calls it, when he didn't get what he wanted, guess what he did? He laid down the floor and he pitched a fit. That's what a spoiled child does, right? I don't think he literally laid down and kicked and cried. But, but the point is, is that he said, well, well, well God, are you, did you lie to me? I mean, I asked for it. You said if I'd be a Christian, you'd bless me. You said, I ask and you'll receive. I didn't receive it. So, so now I'm mad. I'm disappointed. God, you didn't do what you were, said you were going to do. And obviously, as this chapter... I digested that prayer in Matthew 26 there. And as he unfolded what Jesus was really saying there, to, to look at the Bible and to understand, to appreciate what everything it has, let it be your guide. And when you're going to study a particular subject, you pull every passage that deals with that subject. Before you get disappointed or discouraged. In other words, you look at all the expectations of God before you make a judgment or a conclusion against God. And see, what he was admitting was 
The reason why he got so discouraged is because he was jumping to conclusions too quick. And he would read Matthew 7 and he'd say, well, it ain't happening like that. So he would make the conclusion that God's a liar. And so he'd get discouraged. And, and if we're not careful, people, we, we will, not just people, but us too, will jump to conclusions and forget the fact that God has some expectations that, like, for example, in the subject of prayer, it's Him before us. It's, it's not us before Him. The spoiled child syndrome says, it's me before everything else. But in prayer, it's God before us and it always will be. Meaning, it's always God's will before I... Now, if we ask anything according to His will, oh, but Matthew 7 didn't say that, but other places in the Bible do, right? So if you're going to understand a subject... He makes a very good a Bible study principle at the end of chapter 40 when he says, get the whole matter of the subject before you draw a conclusion or else you're bound to be discouraged for the entirety of your Christian walk. And so we got to help people to overcome discouragement, overcome disappointment, and I hope that we've shared some thoughts and ways that we can do that. Thank you for being here this morning.